we will start by the characteristics of, um, of the book, um, and then we'll be doing back and forth, back and forth, uh, of certain important features of Revelation that I think um, we need to know, uh, we need to pay attention. Yeah, so the book is, uh, is known as the Revelation of John, um, and this is the only prophetic book we have in the New Testament, the only prophetic book. We have about 17 uh, prophetic books in the Old Testament, and uh, the New Testament we only have uh, the book of Revelation, which is not only prophetic, but it's also uh, apocalyptic. We'll see in a minute that uh, Revelation has got three uh, genres, or three type, three types of uh, uh, literature, three in one. It is prophetic, it is a later, and it is also apocalyptic. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll look at that um, in a minute. But in terms of uh, prophecy, this is the only prophetic book. We may have some prophecies here and there in, in New Testament, like, for instance, uh, some prophetic materials in the Gospels, uh, but the Gospel as a whole is a genre. It's not a prophetic uh, book. The only prophetic book we have in the New Testament is the book of Revelation. It is called prophecy several times um, in Revelation 1-3, um, Revelation 22, verse 7, 10, 8, and 9 is prophecy. So a nearer description of the book is given. However, in the name of Apocalypse, I will explain uh, the apocalyptic uh, fe feature of Revelation. For there is a difference between the prophetic books of the Bible in general, and that part of them that may said to be belong to the apocalyptic literature. Just like the book of Daniel, for instance, the book of Ezekiel, um, the book of Isaiah, these books are not um, uh, apocalyptic um, in nature as a whole, but you have some portions uh, of, of these books that are very apocalyptic. So different from uh, the book of Revelation, the whole of Revelation is apocalyptic in nature and it is also prophetic. So a characteristic feature of the book is that its thoughts is largely clothed, uh, clothed in symbolic language uh, derived from some of the prophetic books of the Old Testament. So much that even when we get to some difficult passages in the book of Revelation, the first um, the first impression or the first uh, uh, thing we need to have in mind is first and foremost let us approach it uh, in a way of symbolic first. Uh, so because this is the basic feature of the book, it's more symbolic, full of visions and full of um, uh, imageries, we'll see this uh, um, as we go on. So hence it is its correct understanding is greatly facilitated by studying the writer's Old Testament sources. I will repeat this several times. Um, so the writer goes so often in the Old Testament. There are, there are books that almost, almost every section of the Bible has been somehow quoted or alluded to in the book of Revelation. Although we know there are uh, specific books in the Old Testament that the writers made use of. Uh, so um, intense, like the book of Daniel, the book of Ezekiel, the book of uh, Isaiah, and the book of Zechariah, um, those books, and the book of Psalms, he makes use of those books. So it is, but ev almost every section of our Bible has been somehow alluded or echoed by the uh, book of Revelation. So. Uh, many of the images and metaphors and symbols that we get from Revelation, many of them, they either come from the Old Testament or they come from the Greco-Roman world. So I will, be, I will always uh, recommend and I will repeat this several times that um, we want, when we get stuck in terms of the meaning of some of the imagery, some of the sim symbols, symbolic languages that the, the writer is communicating, the best places to go is either the Old Testament or we really go in the world view of the Greco-Roman world. This is where uh, the, the writer has its source for symbolic 
and also uh, imageries. So we'll come back to this. So the language of the Apocalypse, um, the book of Revelation, differs from that of all the rest of New Testament. So much that we should take it so seriously in terms of its genre. You know, so before we start asking the question of what does it mean, it's better we start with how does it mean. By how does it mean, I mean what is the genre, what is the package that the writer has chosen to convey or communicate uh, whatever message he, he has for the readers. It was his own choice. He has a message, but he packages the message in a particular format of this particular literature. So we need to start by how does it mean, which means we deal with the issue of genre, the genre of the book, how does it work as, how does apocalypse or apocalyptic literature, how does it work? Because John is using some conventional uh, elements on how to communicate through this means, very important. So it's very different from the way you approach a later, a typical later, although Revelation has got some features <coughs> of the later, but we don't approach it the way you approach the later of Paul to Colossians, um, the way you read the book of Psalms, you know, because of different type of literature that you're dealing with. So you need to appreciate, you, need sh you should be humble enough to understand that this book has not been written in a format that I'm used. So you need to get used to the, um, uh, the rules uh, of that. So um, many ling uh, uh, linguist ling linguistics, uh, they, they give a metaphor when they talk about a genre or when they talk about a, a type of literature, they give a metaphor of a game, okay? So the, each game has got its own rules, okay? So uh, what you may call a score, a, a goal in a particular game may not necessarily be a goal or a score in another game, right? So uh, um, for you to enjoy and see the meaning, uh, enjoy a game like cricket or uh, soccer or basketball or whatever game it is, every game has got a certain set of rules that you need to follow. Otherwise, if you want to apply, you get the rules of a one game and put in another game, you may end up having a lot of difficulties. This is uh, a way of understanding genres in the Bible. So the way you approach an apocalyptic literature should be different from the way you approach a typical letter or the gospel as a genre, so that you understand what the writer is conveying or communicating. So there are some irregularities, and I, I inserted this um, uh, one for the sake of you are doing Greek. When two nouns are in a position, uh, like in apocalyptic literature, especially in the book of, of you've done the opposition, right? When two nouns are in a position, um, let's say for instance, um, um, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, uh, comma, the great city of God. <coughs> Jerusalem, comma, the great city of God. So, uh, Jerusalem and the great city are in a position, okay? In a position in the sense that, so, um, the great city is Jerusalem, I'm talking about. Jerusalem, comma, the great city of God. Um, so, when two nouns are in, in uh, a position or sometimes in opposition, the second usually is put in the nominative. Uh, whatever the case. So we'll see this um, as we move on. There are some ir irregularities which considered abstractly uh, perfectly legitimate but are contrary to the established uh, Greek language or Greek usage um, because of the nature of the literature itself. You don't expect to get all the grammatical rules of Greek well. False concord in gender, Constructions and sensum are also frequently found. I will, re I will repeat this element uh, several times uh, as we move on, especially as we begin to tackle those strategic and uh, so-called complica complicated passages in Revelation. So Revelation is unique in the sense that it is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. The genre is threefold. Revelation is prophetic, 
Revelation is apocalyptic. Revelation is a letter. And the prophetic material, the apocalyptic material, the uh, idea of a letter, all of them are also packaged in a fundamental um, structure we call um, a narrative. Uh, there's also a narrative genre going on in the book, but a narrative that is conveyed in a prophetic, apocalyptic, apocalyptic way. So sorting out first the, uh, the, cri the critical issue of what kind of or what form of literature is the book is very important. That's why I said before you begin to ask the question of what does it mean, we should begin by how does it mean. It's very important. The metaphor that many linguists have used, as I said, to describe literary genre is that of a game. You can think of each genre in the Bible as a different kind of game, complete with its own set of rules, like the football or basketball. So the book of Revelation has got its own set of rules that we need to stick, if you want to understand. So we must understand how apocalyptic literature works, its set of rules, this is because the apocalyptic um, is a type of literature that the seer John has chosen to use in Revelation. So we need to understand the set of rules of how it works. So his book is also used as a letter, as a narrative, and also as prophecy. So we need to familiarize ourselves with conventional sets of rules. Um, this morning I was um, talking to a friend who is in South Africa asking me questions about the same book of, of, of Revelation. So, um, so I, I, I said I don't think John, John has got an important message, um, John the Seer, an important message of comfort, message of encouragement to the people. I don't think he intentionally put it in a genre that will complicate the reader or the readers to understand. He's writing to the people of God to encourage them, to comfort them, to show them uh, how they should live in a, in a, in a conflict cosmic context. Uh, so there's no point of complicating the readers. Um, so, so what he has chosen to write and the format that he has used uh, was in the understanding of the readers. So he expected the readers to understand because the readers, uh, and they know the set of rules of uh, how, by the time John was writing this, there were already a lot of apocalyptic literatures going around, a lot of them, a lot of them. So the book of, the book of Revelation is not the only apocalyptic literature that we have, first of all, in the Bible and, and also outside of the Bible. There were a lot of uh, um, written materials that were circulating already using the same formats or the same genre. So the readers of John were already familiar with the kind of um, uh, literature that John was using. So he didn't put it in this particular format to just complicate or maybe to make it harder to understand, not at all. You know, he was conveying a very important message to the people of God. So he's, he knows they will get it, they will understand. So one thing about, I've, I've skipped a number of things about, remember I've said Revelation is prophetic, is apocalyptic, is a letter, and is also narrative. But let me talk something about the apocalyptic, some of the things that you expect to find in apocalyptic literature, not just in the book of Revelation, every a genre uh, which comes in that format of apocalyptic, you expect things like this. So uh, the genre of apocalyptic um, itself, yeah, so apocalypticism um, is a literature, is a genre, it's a system of beliefs. Um, and also it's like a social movement. So a revelation is given to an honored figure of the past. Uh, but for instance, you find a lot of literatures were written, you know, revelation, I mean, apocalypse of, of Abraham, 
Apocalypse, the, 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 the Apocalypse of Job and Enoch, uh, Enoch and something like that. Not necessarily that Enoch is the one who, who wrote. This is one of the sets set of the set, set, uh, rules that uh, you find in Apocalyptic. But the only difference you find in the book of Revelation is that the writer of Revelation is John, and he doesn't hide his name. Uh, but most of the time in apocalyptic literature, you find that a revelation is given to an honored figure of the past. You know, you find the apocalypse of John, the apocalypse of, of, of Abraham, uh, the apocalypse of Paul, or something like that. Um, it's one of. It's, it's not like the intention is to um, just to hide. But that's just one of set of rules of how that literature works. So the word apocalypse is based on the Greek word meaning revelation or unveiling. Uh, what is unveiled in apocalyptic literature? What is it that you are trying to unveil or to reveal in a literature that is, uh, is apocalyptic? Primarily, events that will happen at the end of history. Primarily, you are trying to unveil events that will happen at the end of history. So, to be specific, for instance, according to Revelation Chapter 1, verse 1, Revelation is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. That's what it says. Why Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ, according to the theology of New Testament, he is the eschaton. Jesus is the eschaton. He's the last one. Okay? So the word apocalyptic is synonymous to the word eschatological sometimes, uh, based on the word eschaton, which the dictionary defines as end of the world, and end of time, uh, climax of history. So there was a lot we can say on this one. But let's go uh, and back a little bit and see one, some, of, some of the features of apocalyptic. In apocalyptic literature, you find cosmic battle. If we take a wide angle view of what happens in apocalyptic literature, we see a great cosmic conflict between good and evil. And this is what you get in the book of Revelation. There's a great conflict that is going on between good and, and evil. So um, after defining Revelation, so uh, some, some of the things that you expect to get in uh, apocalyptic literature, number one is cosmic battle. Uh, so I was saying that um, if we take a wide angle view of what happens in apocalyptic literature. We see a great cosmic conflict between good and evil. Uh, you see opposing sides. We find God and Satan. We find the saints um, and then Revelation uses a lot of um, symbolic languages to, dis to describe the people of God. He, sometimes uh, he uses numbers. Sometimes he uses uh, 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 figures, you know, for instance, he uses 144,000 just to talk about the people of God. Sometimes he uses lampstands. Um, and we'll see there are not a lot of things. But you find that at the end of the day, you have two opposite sides. You find God on one side with, um, with his followers and Satan on the other side. And Revelation uses the words um, earth dwellers. Some translations use earth dwellers. And some translations, the, the inhabitants of the earth. So the inhabitant of the, of the earth in Book of Revelation is not just anybody, but it's the, the followers of, of force, uh, the forces of evil, the followers of the dragon, the non-believers. So you have two opposing sides. We find God and Satan, the saints of God, and the followers of Satan, uh, the followers of Satan who are known as, they are known as um, the inhabitant of the earth. So descriptions of apocalyptic writing regularly uses the word um, dualism uh, as the defining traits. It's not just a book of Revelation. It's, it's about uh, an apocalyptic literature. So you expect at least two sides opposing the good and evil. Okay. So this is a view of the universe, the universe which is divided between forces of good and, and evil. Not in the sense that God is equal to Satan, not in that sense, that uh, we've got two equal forces, like God is equal to Satan, but in tribute to the great spiritual divide. There's a very great spiritual divide that lies 
at the heart of the universe, and there's, and then there's battle. Now, Apocalypse is a battle story, just like our Bible, uh, our New Testament revelation. It is a story of a battle, of a conflict. And this element of conflict provides a helpful overarching framework within which to fit the details in the text. So do not forget that. Use this as a framework so the whole story of Revelation from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22, it's a story of a conflict. It's a, it's a battle story. Okay? And then all the details that should they should be put in between. So a given passage uh, might present one combatant sometimes uh, or a side rather than a conflict between the two sides, but we assimilate even such passages as a story of conflict. What I'm talking about is, for instance, you get some, some texts, uh, some passages in Revelation, they will just probably focus on one side, one combatant, uh, maybe um, uh, describing a lot about the followers of the Lamb, the church, or sometimes focusing on the Lamb uh, or Christ himself, and sometimes it will focus on the beast and describing even if there's uh, nothing of a story of a conflict, but remember that the overarching um, a structure of the whole book is a conflict, is a battle story. Now, in keeping with cosmic scope of the battle, the agents are rarely ordinary people. So in apocalyptic literature, he would, he rarely will use you know, human beings, people, uh, but he will use, um, you know, he use visions uh, which is very much elevated above ordinary standards. Now the agents in apocalyptic visions or battle, uh, they are most of the time they are uh, visionary beings. That's why you find the book of Revelation is full of visions. And it's not only Revelation but apocalyptic literature full of visions. And the agents are most of the time mysterious beasts. He will use beasts um, rising out of the earth. Um, uh, like in Daniel, he uses the idea of the king of the south, the king of the north, or something like that, because Daniel is also very much apocalyptic. And he uses the idea of the king of the south who attacks the king of the north, sometimes in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 40. Or sometimes, like in Zechariah, which is also apocalyptic, he uses you know, uh, horses that are dispatched uh, to patrol the old earth, um, because this is what we'll expect. So the agents that are involved in a battle, they are not all, uh, most of the time, they are not like human beings, it's full vision, sometimes beast. Now, an important aspect of apocalyptic literature is the final triumph of good and defeat of evil. That's what we, we expect. Uh, so apocalypse is, uh, apocalyptic literature is a story of unhappy ending just like our, our book of Revelation. So there will be a story of conflict going on, a cosmic battle, but at the end, it's not just like uh, prophetic material, but apocalyptic we will expect happy ending. You'll find that in the end, good will defeat evil. Okay, just like what we get in Revelation chapter 22. Finally, you find that the followers of the Lamb are now in the presence of, of the Lamb and the presence of God, and then there is now a blissful moment of, of, of enjoying. So that's very, very important. The battle is not a battle between equals, no, but uh, this does not minimize the strength of the life uh, or death struggle. There's a life and death struggle going on in the book of Revelation, but at the end of the story, it is unhappy ending. The power of evil in apocalyptic literature is terrifying. You'll see sometimes they are being presented like um, um, grasshoppers, you know, uh, with the human hair, uh, with the um, teeth of scorpions, and uh, very terrifying in, 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 revelation, in, in, uh, in apocalyptic literature. Forces of evil, and sometimes beasts, will see the beast out of the earth, uh, the beast out of the land, the beast out of, we'll see how they are being described, how they are being presented, uh, sometimes, you know, very, very um, terrifying, and often drives, you know, us uh, to a temporal despair of us we read and contemplate. So at a given moment, the customary motif of battlefield suspense enters our minds as we read. 
So, but as there isn't ultimate suspense about the outcome, it is always a story of one happy ending. You'll see that in Revelation 22. So one more dimension I wanna mention about the, the genre of the book um, should be noticed that the conflict is not simply between good and evil, uh, but it's also a contrast between this age and the age to come. It's a contrast between this age and the age to come. This is not, uh, this is not probable from the single passage, but from the overall movements of how the book of Revelation goes, you'll see that. Yeah, and we've got special categories of symbolism. The book is full of symbols. As I said at the beginning, that when you get stuck um, into a particular passage or text that is a little complicated, I think the first guess you should follow the symbolic interpretation first, because that's the nature of the book. The book is very symbolic, and there's this the special category, categories of symbolism. Besides symbolism and symbolic reality in general, apocalyptic visions make use of special categories of symbols. While these can appear anywhere in literature, by the occur concentrated fashion in apocalyptic vision. You can get visions uh, in many other uh, parts of the Bible, in prophetic materials, but when you get to apocalyptic literature, you see that this is actually where visions belong, a lot of uh, them. So one category is the, uh, the, the symbolic language of animals. You know, uh, one category is animals that appear not only as part of the strange world motif, uh, but that also possess symbolic meanings. So you find animals going, um, when, when, when Revelation is talking about the judgment in the format of trumpets, I will explain that. Uh, at some point he describes uh, one, of, one, of, one of the judgment is the, grass, the grasshoppers that are coming and then they will control and disturb the world, especially the inhabitants of the earth, for about five months. Um, and so the language of five months associated with grasshoppers is very important. Um, and especially when you share the same world view with the readers, then you understand what's the combination uh, between the lifespan of uh, these uh, grasshoppers and five, and five months. I will explain this as we get to the, to the numbers. And uh, in this, in this class, um, I've, I've, I've picked, there are a lot of numbers in Revelation, but I've picked the, the ones I think are very um, important for us. Um, mm -hmm. Numbers that sometimes have made a lot of uh, uh, co controversies around, you know, numbers like uh, 666, numbers like 144, uh, such numbers, 42, uh, 42 months, uh, 1,260 days, all those numbers, we'll see how Revelation uh, makes use of those numbers, in, in, in especially in um, the Apocalypse of John. So we have special categories. Uh, it used sometimes is animals as symbols of a certain message. Sometimes color symbolism is also important. Uh, sometimes numbers, you know. Uh, so when you get numbers like three, like seven, like ten, like twelve in any other parts of any other genre of the Bible. So they may not uh, probably have a significant meaning uh, as you get them in Revelation. You know. So in Revelation, you find that they are uh, actually um, very important, very, very important. Not necessary. So, what, so the point I want to make is that you, for instance, for instance, if I say, um, if we read no, when we read, when we read in, in just an example on top of my head, okay. let me give an example. No, when you read, for instance, in the in 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 in, um, in the gospel, that when Jesus was entering Jericho, you know, he was entering Jericho, he found two blind men. You know? so uh, I don't have to begin to make a big deal out of number two. So what does two mean in in? Because I know the genre of the gospel, uh, I don't think the writer wants to convey significant meaning by telling us that there were two, and therefore two means Old Testament and New Testament or something like that. You know, uh, why? Because I want to appreciate the packaging 
of the genre that has been used to convey particular meaning. So 666 is very symbolic, is very significant in a genre which is apocalyptic and sometimes prophetic. But when I get this number uh, elsewhere out of the genre which is apocalyptic, I don't, I, 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 don't, I don't have to convey the meaning unless if the context allows. That's the point I want to make. So we are safe when we begin to go the route of symbolic in Revelation, we are safe, we may get it wrong, but that is a safe passage already because Revelation is symbolic. But we are not safe when we begin to go like that as we read the parables, for instance. Okay? This is the point I wanted to, to make. So a, lo a lot of these, anyway. Yeah. We'll come back to that. Let's talk about authorship. Uh, I think I want to, 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 to skip this issue of, the, of authorship. Um, um, some New Testament scholars um, would be happy to say the book of Revelation was written by John the prophet, uh, not, not, uh, not necessarily John the apostle, uh, but I am of the view that it was written by John uh, the Elder, John the Apostle of the Lord Jesus, John the Beloved, the Beloved Disciple of Jesus. And um, he is writing to primarily those seven um, <coughs> representative churches in Asia Minor. Now, again, in terms of context, I'll leave that with you. I believe personally that he uh, was some kind of persecution going on, although it was not uh, everywhere in Asia Minor, but it was somehow heading towards becoming so serious in every part of Asia. And Revelation is written in that particular context of some... The reason I'm saying this is because not all New Testament you know, scholars agree that there was some kind of conflict or some kind of persecution going on. It's just some pockets of isolated cases here and there, and then we don't have to make a big deal out of persecution in the book of Revelation. Some believe like that. Um, as they say the only, the only historical and cultural problem we have is the issue of the imperial cult that was going in the Roman, in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, but I believe, I believe there was, there was there is, there's a lot of uh, uh, text in the book of Revelation alluding to persecution, alluding to suffering of believers, uh, and I believe that it was in that context that this particular book is given in order to provide a comfort and encouragement to believers that were going um, through that. This is about the, uh, the recipient of the, of the letter. Yeah. So let me say something about the occasion then and purpose of writing. So the historical condition that led the composition of the book of Revelation was one of increasing hardship for the church and of an <coughs> imminent life of death struggle uh, with hostile world represented by the Roman Empire. Uh, so the demand for the deification of the emperor became ever more insistent uh, and was extended to uh, the provinces. And so the first century cultural and historical context is key to understand some of the symbolic languages that John is explaining. So we speculate sometimes, when uh, most of the time, because we do not share the same worldview, and then we are far removed from the political and historical context of John. It's okay, and so that's the reason why we begin to speculate, but if you want to get what John is communicating through the symbols that he's using, the best place, places to go, as I said earlier on, is either you go in the Greco-Roman historical and cultural context because he shares the same worldview. This is how we communicate, even in Africa, wherever you go, we communicate uh, and we get the message uh, from each other because of a shared understanding of worldview. So John is writing to people that he share um, the uh, same historical and cultural, political context of the first century. 
and, uh, and, and also that's the first place you go. The second place you go is the book, uh, is the Old Testament, where it gets a lot of uh, symbolic languages um, um, to, to communicate. This is very, very, very important. Before you begin to look for figures in Revelation and look for COVID-19 COVID in Revelation, where is it and so forth and so on, you must first and foremost go to the first century, see whether COVID-19 was part of the, the worldview there. Very important. Is, is, is seeing um, uh, the, vision, the visions we get in Revelation, they are not made up visions. You know. He actually saw the visions. And uh, because it is a vision, therefore it has got, a, the, the first and foremost is a vision, then it has primarily a symbolic language that is communicating. And God is, is using vision, visions to a person who uh, may understand those visions because of his historical and, and cultural and worldview context that he's in. Okay. The visions, uh, they are not like, um, they are real, real visions, uh, but they come like package of, of, of a message, a real message God is trying to communicate using vivid pictures, you know, to make it so, um, so God is using those means to convey a very strong message, which was urgent, actually, it, in bringing about comfort and encouragement to the people of God. So, and John also uses the same format of conveying the message because he thinks, you know, when you have a message to convey, you choose what means are you going to use, whether you'll sing through your song, you convey a message, whether you'll use a, a political oracle or something like that, so for John, he thought uh, this particular message I have is so urgent, so important for the church at this particular time to make it so urgent, so vivid in, in people, man. Let me use this genre of apocalyptic. Uh, and, and that was not something foreign or strange to the readers. You know, it's, it's real. It was actually real. We saw a lot of visions. Now, um, before we skip this, this page, let me tell you something about the style and the structure that John has used. Uh, the, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, the dispensationalism. Uh, you know, they take the book of Revelation in a straight, in a, in a straight line uh, in terms of structure, okay? So what they think is that the 22 chapters of Revelation, they are divided into dispensations, okay? And those dispensations are actually put in a chronological order, the way the dispensationalism, they will, they will put it. For instance, they will say uh, Revelation chapter 1 up to chapter 3 is a dispensation, okay? So dispensation of the church. Whatever you read in Revelation 1, 2, and 3, it concerns the church age, the period of the church, a certain dispensation we call the dispensation of the church. And they would argue to say this is the reason why in those three chapters you find the word church or churches appears quite a lot in that because it's a dispensation of the church. And then they move on to say from chapter 4, all the way to chapter 18. That part, it is another dispensation, the dispensation of what they call the tribulation, the great tribulation. And some, they go as far as saying, before that dispensation begins, there should be a certain event that is important. Some, they put, they put rapture. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 4, the rapture, the rapture of the church. And when you ask them, where do you get the idea of rapture? They get it from that little phrase in chapter 4, verse 1, when John is invited to say, come up here, come up here. So the come up here represents the rapture of the church, according to them, because John is a representative of the people of God. So what you get in chapter 4, verse 1, is the rapture which opens another dispensation, the dispensation of tribulation. Where is the church? the church? The church is nowhere from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 18, the church is not there. 
And they say because you don't even find the word church in, in, those, in those chapters, right? And they go as far as now dividing the tribulation into two sections. So the first half of the great tribulation and the second half of the great tribulation. So the first half of the great tribulation, they say it's from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 8 verse 1. What you get in chapter 4 all the way to chapter 8 verse 1, you find the seals judgment, the seven seals of judgment. So they, those ones, they up, and I think when you will do your um, eschatology, you'll be able to address things like this. So the first half of the Great Tribulation, the dispensationalists, they say, that's the part where you get the judgment of the seals. The church is, or some they believe the church is already raptured, you know, and some they say the church is still there uh, in the first half, experiencing the seven seals of judgment. Now when you get to chapter 8, verse 1, that's the middle, the middle of the tribulation, uh, and then the second half begins from verse 2 onward up to chapter 18. That's what they think. They think. Now, in that part of the story, uh, the, uh, of, of, of the section of, the, uh, of, of, uh, of Revelation, they say this is where you get the, the judgment in form of trumpets and the judgment in forms of bowls of judgment. And this is a period where you find the two witnesses. And then they will say the two witnesses um, prophesying is either Elijah and Enoch uh, or maybe it's Elijah and Moses. They don't actually agree and for some reasons, okay? So chapter 4 to chapter 18, tribulation, which is divided into the first half of tribulation and the second half of tribulation, following chronologically chapter 1 up to 3, which is the age of the church. That's what they put it, okay? Now, by the time you get to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation, they say, wow, this is now the actual coming of Jesus. So the coming up here in chapter 4 verse 1 is the rapture. It's not the actual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the rapture of the church. Now in chapter 19, which comes after chapter 18, of course, which 18 is, is the end of the tribulation. So what you get in chapter 19 there is the actual coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, which is going to be followed with the uh, Armageddon battle uh, at the end of that chapter and opens up now. Uh, it's going to be followed by the Armageddon battle, even the, the judgments, the, the great judge, white judgments, uh, uh, throne of God in chapter 20 and opens up another dispensation. They call the dispensation of eternity. So the book of Revelation, according to uh, dispensationalism, is divided into about four uh, dispensations, so to speak. So the dispensation of the church, the dispensation of the great tribulation, uh, which is divided into two, the first half and the second half, and the dispensation of great um, tribulation. Uh, and this way of, of, of reading does not, you know, the great mat is when you get chapter four all the way to chapter 18, that's, that's, that's a huge, huge material which does not concern the church. So, because the church is not there, you know, the church is somewhere. Whatever you read in that passage talking about the saints, the saints is not referring to the church. The saints, according to them, is referring to the Israelites or those that have been left behind. You know, the left behind um, series. Yeah, so I don't believe... I don't believe um, this is not a, this is not a natural division of the book. It's very artificial. This is imposing a structure on a book. John has got a back and forth kind of structure. We'll see this. So is the same way John writes one John. He goes and comes back, goes and comes back, back and forth, up and down, back and forth, up and down. This is how the book of Revelation has written. So uh, the major period in the book of Revelation is the period we call church age, and then the book is trying to describe the same period of time from different angles. He goes and he comes back. He goes and he comes back, back and forth, up and down. That's the structure. It's a very eclectic kind of structure. We'll see this as we move on. So this is about the structure. Um, which I'm going to 
In terms of time and composition, the book was written uh, probably toward the end of first century during the time of the mission, uh, the reign of the mission. This is what most, uh, most uh, uh, commentators believe. Some, they want to put it during the time of Nero, um, but when we begin to uh, unpack Revelation 13, um, especially with the beastology, the, the doctrine of the beast, you will see that Revelation was not uh, written during the time of Nero, who died in 68. Um, he committed suicide. Okay. So the method that he used was apocalypse. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a specific message to those like the three, the, the seven churches, the seven letters to seven churches. And also at the end of every letter, they listen to what the Holy Spirit has to speak to churches in plural. So there's, there's, a, there's a sense where the message goes to a particular church. There's a sense that also it is uh, it, conveying a message that is applicable to the, to the all people of God everywhere. We'll see the, the application of the church. Um, our, our approach is that this book as a whole is written to the communities of believers, all of them, uh, of the first century, and also it has uh, applications and messages and that apply to the people of God of all time. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let me, let me talk about the traditional approaches quickly there. Um, traditionally, we've got um, four approaches to the book of Revelation. There's what we call the preterist approach to the book, and uh, you'll get this in your uh, eschatology, I think. Um, the Preterist approach takes the historical context of Revelation seriously and attempts to understand the book how John's audience would have understood it. Uh, and many of the events of Revelation are seen as having been fulfilled in the first century. So that's why they call themselves Preterist, in the sense that everything we read, almost everything we read in Revelation, almost everything, uh, apart from uh, passages that probably address the uh, judgment and the coming of the Lord. Almost everything uh, was fulfilled in the first century. Actually, it is part of the first century. They call themselves preterists, you know, and they take the historical, cultural context of John seriously and say everything is, a, so there's nothing about um, 21st century or whatever century may find. This is uh, the first approach. The second approach is what we call the historicist approach, uh, which is very, very popular. Uh, the historicist approach is the approach that they think Revelation was, is, was written like history beforehand. It's history written beforehand. You know, whatever we are going through, it's like, it's, it's like it was already written, and all we need is just to get back and see um, this, this conflict between Russia and Ukraine where is it in Revelation? Uh, because it is Revelation is history that has already been written beforehand. So if, if, if you follow that kind of approach, this is how you'll be, you'll be looking at events that you, you face. Uh, so it's history written beforehand. Historicist, yes. No, for them, no. It's just when it's, it's history, it's before, yeah, yeah. For them, uh, when, when, that's why there's that with inconsistencies. Because as, as, as the world progresses, we have a lot of events coming up and trying to uh, question, you know, whatever, you know, uh, historical events they thought it was, it was what the case in the book of Revelation. So history written beforehand is the, is, is the second. The third one is the futurist, fu future, futurist approach. Now the futurist approach, they, um, most dispensationalists, they, they, most of them, they take this approach. They think that um, a, a large portion of the book of Revelation belongs the future after probably the rapture or uh, when the beast uh, appears, the actual beast appears. Uh, so they will take seriously the first three chapters of Revelation to say these chapters, they belong to us. This is where we can get a lot of encouragement, but starting from chapter four all the way to chapter 23 is futuristic, is future, and this will come probably uh, with the introduction of uh, the beast or maybe with the event of rapture. And the last one is the idealist approach. Um, does not mean Revelation 
uh, in, does not understand Revelation in terms of any particular reference to time, but rather relates it to the ongoing struggle between good and evil. Uh, and, and some would call this symbolic approach. So it is an ongoing struggle between good and evil. Now, what is our approach? Uh, my approach and our approach. Um, so in this course, we advocate for uh, what I have termed like parallelist approach, um, which I take from Greg. I also take it from uh, Hendrickson, that the book is, um, you know, is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it's this is another way of understanding idealist approach, uh, which means there is no single fulfillment, no single fulfillment. The reparalist approach assumes and advocates that there is no single fulfillment. There are only transcendent principles, and this is important. Transcendent principles and recurring themes in Revelation, they come back the forth, back and forth. As the reading, it is very close to what we call idealist approach with some preterist and historicist elements. So what we do is we appreciate, we don't reject all these approaches above, but there's some elements we take from there. So this approach is also called an eclectic, eclectic approach to Revelation. This is what I'm proposing. Uh, to reading by Ace and Duval. So they argue that an approach that seeks to combine the strength of several and the above approaches uh, by advocating for no single fulfillment. The starting point is the first century first. This is what this approach is all about. So you read Revelation 13, 17, 22, whatever chapter you get in, the first starting point is how the first century believers might have understood. That's where we start from. And then we look at principles, you know, there's no single fulfillment and look at principles and those principles they transcend culture and time. They belong to the same period of time we are all involved in and this period we call the period of the church. And therefore, uh, this is how we appreciate the book. So we believe that there's ongoing conflicts between good and evil. We believe there's ongoing cosmic battle going on, and you and the first century believers, we all share the same period of time, the age, this age and the age to come. Therefore, we begin with the first century believers first, and then from there we get what is the principle. For instance, uh, let's speak Revelation 13, you know, which is talking about the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the land, for instance, so the our starting point is what the first readers might have understood by beasts. And then we pick there what is the principle which is real, is reality in every period of time that we go through. So this is what we call an eclectic view. We get as many strengths as possible in every approach and we move on uh, together. So it is by following this approach, we make revel revelation relevant to the church. Revelations is God's message to the people of God today. Uh, it's, it's a great book of encouragement. It's a great book of comfort that we can preach. It's not something that belongs uh, completely in the past or which has something to do only in the future. It's God's message for people of God who are part of this cosmic battle that we are going through. So we learn about principles. There are a lot of principles that they come uh, uh, again. So uh, what was what, what is represented by the beast, for instance, in the first century, you know, may not necessarily be exactly what uh, we are going through at the moment, but the principle is the same, the same principle, uh, which is actually part of it. This is, this is how we will be looking at Revelation. This is what I'm proposing uh, to read, and this is what I think the book of Revelation is, is all about. It's God's message of comfort to people of God everywhere, so much that you can fi find time to take as many uh, passages as you can to encourage the people of God today. Yes, so, wh so what I'm saying is that the Revelation <coughs> chapter one to chapter 22 is God's message to God's people of all time, all of us, yes. But the starting point as we read, 
we follow the principles of interpretation, we start begin, we begin with the first century believers first. That's where we get the meaning. First and foremost, we get what chapter 13 of Revelation, for instance, what it meant to the original readers. Once we get it, we say this is how they understood, then the second question is, how does this understanding apply to us today? Because the principle is actually the same. We don't ignore the understanding of first century. The 666, okay, the mark of the beast, is not, is not something of the 21st century. Uh, the first century believers understood it in a way. So John communicated something through that. So we go back to the first century and said, what did John mean to the original readers when he said the mark of the beast? So we put ourselves in the shoes of the first century believers first, and we understand how they might have understood it. And then the second question is, if this is how they got it, how does this understanding apply to us today? Because what is the principle which is now beyond culture, beyond time, beyond space, which is God's message to the people of God of all time? so that revelation is not confined to a specific historical period of time, because this is it's not that. It's, it's God's message to the people of God. So this, look at the second one. So the first one I'm saying, for instance, revelation certainly seems to address, certainly it seems to address the first Christian directly. So we should read revelation the same way that we read every other book of the Bible by taking its historical context seriously first. So we go back to the first century, and then we understand what was going on in the Greco-Roman world, and also the world view of John by going back to the Old Testament. And then we understand the second one says, Revelation also presents timeless truths for surviving the struggle between good and evil. And this is very important. And this makes our book of Revelation relevant as God's message of comfort, God's message of encouragement to the people of God. So we've got timeless truths for surviving the struggle between good and evil. The visions of Revelation, they challenge us to forsake our complacency, to stay faithful during times of persecution, even here, even for our brother who is going back to Somalia. Of course, you'll take this one out. Okay? So it is, it is part of, it's a reality of every church of every age. Wherever you go and do ministry, you must expect that, there's, you must bear in mind that we are in a struggle of good and evil. Don't expect that everything will be, will be smooth. This is what Revelation is all about. And then it provides a lot of truths of comfort, dear friends, for all of us of how we can survive in this cosmic battle of good and, 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 and evil that is going on and through times of persecution. Moreover, this book of Revelation certainly has something to say about events still to come. Okay? Some events it describes await future fulfillment, of course, like the return of Christ. We are still waiting for the return, the great white throne of judgment, the arrival of the holy city and so forth and so on. But uh, these we know, these are events that are yet to come. They did not happen even during the time of the first readers, and then they will actually come. But you should know that this is the message of Revelation, addressing the ongoing struggle between evil and good, but with an happy ending, because this is how apocalyptic literature is. So this approach differs from one elaborated above, as noted in the method, the research, this so. I was doing my research and we research. Undertaking agrees the scholars who believe that the series of plagues recapitulates one another. So those series that we have, like the series of, uh, of judgment coming through the format of seals, seals judgment, and also the trumpets, and also the balls of judgment, they are not to be understood in a chronological order, in the sense of saying, now this is this is, these are judgments coming, uh, trumpets. After these, we'll go through. So they happen, you know, they happen co uh, 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 
simultaneously, you know. It is, let me, let me give you uh, this metaphor of maybe six. It's uh, what John is doing, for instance, he has one period in his mind. And that period is the period of the church, which is going to, uh, is, is describing as 1,260 days. Now, he looks at this period of time from different angles. From one angle, he looks as if we are going through seven trumpets of judgment. From the other angle, the same period of time as if it's seals of judgment. From the other angle, so they all happen simultaneously depending on what, what, how, how you look at the, at the period of time. So um, get this as a structure so that it will really help us as we begin to uh, address uh, some strategic uh, uh, passages uh, uh, we have in Revelation. Remember what I said? So we read Revelation the same way you read any other book of the Bible. You begin with the meaning, and the meaning is what the writer communicated to the first readers. That's the meaning. What did it mean to them? So we, f we have to work very hard to grasp what the writer communicated to the readers. That's the meaning. Once that is grasped, you get it. And then the second question is, how does this apply to someone like me living in Ethiopia, to someone like me living in Africa? Uh, what, what's the application? So it's only when we understand what it meant first, we will be able to see how that principle may work in our lives today. So we take the historical, cultural context of the first readers seriously, just like the preterists, they do. But at the same time, we know it is God's message to the people of God, and then it has those truths that may apply to all of us. So if, if, you, if, if we take the four approaches, and then you ask me, where do I belong, for instance? Right? Uh, I am the last one, the idealist approach which is uh, what, uh, in my research paper, I don't call it idealist, I call it parallelist approach because my focus is on the structure of the book, how the book has got parallels. Sections are run, they run parallels to each other. Okay, we've, for instance, we've got chapter one to chapter three as a section, chapter four to chapter seven as a section, they run uh, parallel to each other, explaining the same period of time. So with the focus of parallelism, uh, don't use it like idealist, even if it's idealist approach, because my focus was on the, on, the, on, the, on the structure of the book. So it is a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth kind of structure. It is a up and down, up and down. Sometimes John will take us up, sometimes will bring us down. Sometimes we move forward, sometimes we come back forward, just like, eh, backward, just like that, in terms of structure. Having said that these are parallels, right? You know, they recapitulate each other. So each time John comes back, because he goes sometimes forward, and he comes, each time he comes back, he comes with new features of the same period of time. So as you preach and as you read, you must know what is new in this particular uh, section, uh, which he did not explain in the first section. Uh, this, it's like looking at the same period of time you know, from different angles. You know? So you look at this angle, there's something you miss, but it's, there's also something you benefit. As you move to another angle, there's always something new that, and it's not only new, but sometimes also development. There are some development ideas that John will bring in, um, moving forward the whole story of the battle as we are moving towards the end where we understand the coming, the return of the Lord, the, and, and, and this is important. John is a genius, the way he writes. You, you will be surprised when you read. And not only that, the moment I started my journey in the book of Revelation, I was more convinced of the inspiration of the Bible. More convinced. I came to see that this is not just John writing. There should be someone who has a 100% understanding of history who is talking, who is actually using John. Because the, 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 the details, the way he gets the details there, it's, 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 it's really genius that God is really working behind. 
the whole story. Okay, pluralism is a structure. Um, in terms of revelation, pluralism is, is, is a feature in Hebrew, in the Hebrew uh, poetry, where, whereby the first, um, the first line, I mean the second line or restates uh, the idea of the first line maybe in another way or maybe for emphasis. For instance, um, uh, the word of God is, um, is light on my feet and it's a lamp on my path, something like that. So what is feet is path, what is lamp is light, okay, but expressing in another way. Now in terms of structure, the book of Revelation has been structured as parallelism in the sense that we've got different sections. There may be there may be six or seven sections, and all those sections are all trying to explain the realities of the same period of time, emphasizing in different ways. That's what I mean by parallelist approach, which means I don't see in Revelation a straight line like the way it is explained by the dispensationalists. So what I see is he goes into one section, then he comes back in a par parallel se sense again. He explained the same situation. He comes back. So we've got about six, seven sections. They run parallel to each other, and they all describe the same period of time. But of course, by bringing new features, new principles coming in, uh, not like a straight line. This is what I mean by parallelism. Yeah, because, because the parallelism we get, uh, the meaning we get, now in terms of structure, I'm not saying that uh, it's the same thing he's saying um, in that sense. In the same st in structure, I'm saying is is describing the same period of time. 1,260 days is seen from the approach of seven trumpets. He comes back the same 1,260 days. Let us look at it now from a different angle like seven seals of judgment. Back again, let's look at this. So there are some elements that it may not inform us in one, in one section, but when it comes back, describing the same section, it brings new features, talking about the same. So it is in that sense I'm talking about parallelism. Sections of the book of Revelations are not straight line. Sections of the book of Revelations are running parallel to each other. That's what I mean. 